Welcome back, everyone. We are now open for Q and A, questions and answers. And Barb, are there any um, questions that we'd like to start with from the chat room? Sure, I've got a few here. Okay. One is from Cheryl Hamilton, a CME participant. Does the digital utility meter have any advantage over a smart meter? Um, well, a digital utility meter um, is virtually the same as a smart meter. Um, most of them, well, some of them can, can communicate back and forth. Some of them can't. Um, and so they would have to come by and, and get a meter reading. As long as your whatever meter you have, as long as it's communicating with sending messages out, um, then you're exposed to that radiation. Okay. Okay, and another one from, uh, apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, Mieke Jacobs. What percentage of residential smart meters are part of a mesh? And are there any states that don't have this system? Okay, I'm not up on exactly where the mesh system is. Um, however, very often it's, it's sort of one system per state, um, uh, but you'd have to go to your local utility and find out which kind of meter you have. Alternatively, you can buy, um, uh, a meter and measure it yourself to find out what kind of readings you're getting. And if you're getting that constant noise coming out, then you're part of a mesh system. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask the floor if yep. Are so there many people, people want to. If you, have, if you have a question, all you have to do is raise your hand. And that raise your hand is where? Where do you raise your hand? In the participants window at the bottom, there's a blue blue icon that has raised hand. Okay. People can see that. If you raise your hand, we'll call on you. And then what you can do is unmute yourself and um, turn on your video should you wish to do that. And we have Courtney. Would you like to unmute yourself, Courtney? See, can I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. My name is Courtney and I live in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And during the um, COVID shutdown, Verizon built a 115 foot cell tower um, in my neighborhood. And 10 people have experienced that I know of, uh, headaches, dizziness, nausea, insomnia. And my neighborhood is wanting to know, is there anything that they can do to protect themselves from, uh, from the effects that have started at the time that the tower has begun transmitting? Huh. Well, unfortunately, um, we don't have any rights to ask the telecom industry to move a tower. That comes under the uh, Federal Communication Commission. And it's been very hard for communities to actually remove a tower after the fact. However, more and more people are turning to lawyers to get answers to their questions. And if you mobilized your community, um, had some doctors or scientists involved documenting some of the health sy symptoms and when they began and approached a lawyer, and we can recommend lawyers to you. Um, there are some that are beginning to specialize in this. Um, they might end up taking a, a case as a class action suit. Um, very few um, locations have been successful at having a tower removed, even if there are health effects. And if there's anyone else who has additional information, please let us know and, and share that in, uh, in the chat below. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, Leslie Weinstock. Leslie, could you unmute yourself? Yes, my um, question question is, how many peer-reviewed scientific studies are there and how many peer-reviewed medical studies are there? And can you differentiate between the Supreme Court admissible and the non-Supreme Court admissible on those two questions? 
Okay, uh, dealing with what though? What topic are you talking about? Uh, with um, EMF and RF um, uh, medical symptoms. Okay, there's probably hundreds that we can point you to um, that have been published since about 1960s. Um, so we knew that uh, the radio frequency microwaves were harmful. We knew that way back then. Uh, but the military had control over what the limits were going to be. And uh, we were going through a Cold War after World War II. And so there was you know, a lot of information on microwave radiation was actually classified. And, and it was just um, declassified you know, a few decades later. So there are at least hundreds, if not thousands of studies on radio frequency and extremely low frequency documenting harmful effects that could be used in a, a, in a legal case. So not thousands, it's hundreds. Well, I know of hundreds. There are thousands that I can refer you to. I haven't read all of them, so I don't know how good they are, but there are definitely hundreds. Thank you. Okay, Deanna? Um, yes, hi, Magda. Thank you so much for putting this on. Um, I was wondering, do you know, like in the rural areas where um, one would need to have satellite to have internet connectivity, um, are there meters that can measure? Uh, you know, I have meters that can go up to 10 gigahertz, but I think satellite frequencies are much higher. Um, do those types of sensors exist to really assess how much RF we're getting? If you're talking about the satellite dish that you might have on your home, that won't be above 10 gigahertz right now. Um, it's not until 5G starts rolling out in your you know, state or province where they're going to be using millimeter waves. And there are companies who, who are now trying to develop a, a meter that we can all use that it won't cost us you know, half of our mortgage uh, to purchase. So, <laughs> Um, those meters are coming, but for something that you have in your home right now, chances are the levels will be within uh, measurable range under 10 gigahertz. Oh, all right, great, thank you. You're welcome. Gary Weidman. Do I unmute? Gary, can you unmute I'm, yourself? I'm, tr I'm trying, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, and I guess the video is, it says you've, you've muted my video or something. Uh, okay. You can question question re relates to, uh, okay, host has asked me to start video, which I've pushed that and okay, there we are. There we go. No? I don't know. Can you see me? I can't see myself. It doesn't seem to show up. No, just your name. Uh, go ahead, okay. what's your question? A well, question has to do with smart meters. And uh, speaking of my own particular situation, there are two panels of smart meters, about 20 meters in each panel, uh, located about uh, eight feet apart. And were there ever any uh, standards or limits uh, set by any measure whatsoever, uh, output, number, whatever, on the number of meters that could be put into a single panel uh, radiating into this next department? The radiation would be um, the limit set by the Federal Communication Commission. Uh, and for smart meters, smart, a lot of smart meters are at 900 megahertz. And I think it's 600 microwatts per centimeter squared that is the guideline that they shouldn't exceed. Um, and very, that's, that unfortunately is not measured. So what I would strongly recommend is if you have you know, several banks of smart meters, either hire someone to come and do the measurements or purchase an inexpensive meter, they're not very expensive, and measure it yourself. Chances are it won't go that high. That, that limit is set on um, energy to heat your body. And we're not talking about that. We're actually talking about much more you know, lower levels that have other more subtle biological effects. So my guess is that even a bank of smart meters isn't going to exceed the guideline, but should it no. exceed the guideline, then you, can, you should be able to get um, FCC action. Okay, well, excuse me, we did actually do that uh, already. 
and uh, the reading was something like 43,000 in, uh, oh. in front in front of uh, one of the panels and there are two panels close together and so uh, the problem is uh, talking to our our board and they say okay 43,000 so what and uh, uh, actually, it went off the meter at 43,000. And so uh, how dangerous is this? What can I convey to people to show that this is a serious problem and not uh, battling theories of various types? Okay, well, whenever you say a number, you have to provide the units because they're measured in different units. So oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. That your 43,000 is still below the federal guidelines uh, based on the units that they use. Those guidelines are so high, they're absolutely ludicrous. Um, yeah. And it's almost as though they've been set so that very few locations will exceed them. Um, and so basically what you have to do is you have to, um, if, you, if you decide for legal action, hire a scientist and a medical doctor who can, who's familiar with the research and there's quite a few of them around. Um, and they can then put that information into context based on the literature that's available. Uh, okay, well, this would be the San Francisco area. If you have any, if I email you or you email me, I'd yeah, like let's to- do that. let's do that privately. Uh, okay, and I, we get your email here somewhere? Or... Um, it's drmagdahavis at gmail.com. And Ben, could you put that in the uh, chat at the bottom, drmagdahavis at gmail.com. You can reach me there. Uh, okay, D -d document Havis? Dr. Magda Havis. Uh, Ben's Dr. going to put it in the chat, so just go to the chat. I'm just going to go on Dr. to uh, Miriam. Yes. May uh, maybe Marina? Oh, sorry, Marina. Yes, you're right. Hi. Hi. I have, I have a couple of questions. It's so nice to see you because uh, I met you at the, at the Metro Convention Center at Toronto so many times, and it's a pleasure to see you online. I found a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Uh, I have, uh, if I can put my, uh, I have one of those electric smog meter, meters that make noise, and uh, you know I saw that you were, you were actually uh, doing the uh, the sounds. Uh, I I couldn't tell exactly which devices were giving what sounds. But I have the meter. I have one of those meters, and I would like to, if you, if you can go over them, uh, the, the sounds, which device is giving off which sound, because I have that device myself. I have the the, the electric smog uh, meter myself. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I can't go back to that video without taking too much time. Um, so could you contact me individually, and I'll send you um, the PDF for that document. And you can just, you know, press a button and and uh, for the cell phone or the cordless phone, and it will give you the sound. So okay. if you send me an email, say I'd like the sound um, a PDF, and I'll send it to you. Okay. And then my other question is about the smart meters. Uh, just some clarification, because on the smart meter, you were saying that you have to know whether your smart meter is part of the mesh system or not. And then you you also were saying that you have to wire the smart meter. So I'm not. I'm a bit confused. I don't know what kind of smart meter I have. How do I find out? Okay, well, first of all, smart meters are not normally wired. It, you know, the industry decided it was too expensive. And so most meters, you know, the smart meters that people have are wireless. And whether, you know, it's talking to other smart meters or it's just talking to the utility is absolutely critical for you to know because if it's just talking to the utility, it's going to ping, it's going to give off radiation a few times a day, um, and it's not a, you know, something to be deeply, deeply concerned about. However, if you have a mesh system, it doesn't stop. And these are the ones that are extremely dangerous. And these are the ones, if you happen to know you have one on your home, then ask them if they can wire it. Depending on which jurisdiction you're in, uh, there are different rules and regs about wiring. Some allow it, some don't. Most ask you to pay a certain amount of um, additional um, fee monthly to um, have someone come out and do the reading remotely. So, you know, it really depends on which jurisdiction you're in as to what you can do. But chances are your smart meter is wireless right now. Uh, the only thing you have to determine is whether it's part of the mesh or not. But I'm in Toronto, like, I, how do I determine whether it's part of the mesh or not? 
Well, if you had a meter, you can measure it. And if it's radiating all the time, then you know you're part of the mesh. Let's move on to the next question, please. What was that? I have quite a few questions. Can, we move, on to the, can we move on to the next person, please? This is Ariane. Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. One question per person. Okay. And, and um, if you see questions that uh, from somebody who, that says CME, those are the priority questions. Okay. okay. So let's go to David Calderwood. David, can you unmute yourself and turn on your your video if you like? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? I can, yep. Um, many of the studies, um, you, there were a lot of studies in your presentation, but I didn't see a lot of documentation for them. Is there a way to get that documentation of where we can find those studies so we can share them with others? Actually, I have um, a reference list that I'm going to send out to all the CME people. Okay, great. Thank you. And actually, Ariana is going to send it out. I'll, I'll be giving it to her within um, within a week, and she'll be sending it out to everyone. Next one is uh, Natalie. Natalia, sorry, Barra Miller. Natalia, can you turn? Can you mute yourself? Unmute yourself. Ah, uh, there we go. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so much for a wonderful presentation, and. Um, I just wondering about best meters for that you would recommend to use in the house to measure uh, EMF and radiation. Yeah. Okay, if you're wanting to measure um, radio frequency radiation, I often recommend one called Acousticom 2, and uh, we'll put that information. I don't know if Barb is here. If, if you could put the information there for safelivingtechnology.com, slt.co. Um, is where you can purchase it. LessEMF.com is another place where you can purchase it, and it's called Acousticom too. So if um, if you could, one if someone could put that information in Acousticom too as well. Um, it costs about two hundred and fifty dollars American, and it gives you a sound, it gives you a visual, and you'll be able to tell which kind of smart meter you have, and whatever in your house is wireless uh, will turn up on it. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And that's for EMF, all kinds of radiation? Or, uh... Radio frequency radiation. If you want to find out about low frequency radiation, I would recommend getting a tri-field meter. They're also about $200 and um, you can get them at both of those um, websites. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. We're moving on to the next one. Tom Yerima, could you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, so the, if, um, if oxidative stress is the most common physiologic effect from EMF toxicity to an individual, and we see this, these uh, cases of adolescent sudden cardiac death, um, what is the most reliable method for a clinician to quickly screen for individuals at risk? And is the, uh, do we have evidence that the uh, sudden cardiac death phenomenon is due to oxidative stress or some other mechanism like incoherence? Okay, that's a really excellent question. Uh, we don't actually know why these young people have a higher sudden cardiac arrest. Um, however, the studies are saying that we really should look into this even though the rates are still quite low the fact that they're increasing should be causing us concern. Dr. Steven Sinatra said that sometimes there are minor irregularities with the heart. Wolf Parkinson's white syndrome, for example, is one of them. And if someone has this, let's say a young child has Wolf Parkinson's white, white sy syndrome and there's no problem with it, they're, you know, they're doing okay. You have them in an exercise class and you expose them to Wi-Fi, and their heart can then stop beating. And so he, he estimated what percentage of the population have this and actually agreed with me that there should be screening done, cardiovascular screening done by you know, someone qualified, obviously, to make sure that there's no abnormality, elect electrical abnormality in the heart. If you want to find out whether someone's electrically hypersensitive, the best way to do it is simply monitor their heart 
and expose them to something that they, you know, in a clean environment, expose them to their cell phone or, you know, a Wi-Fi router. And if their heartbeat changes, um, then they're probably electrically sensitive and they have to really avoid that kind of frequency. When you say heart, heartbeat changes, are you talking about heart rate variability or just heart rate or rhythm? A combination. Uh, the heartbeat will probably change. The, it'll become um, irregular. And if you do heart rate variability, you'll notice changes in both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Thank you. Okay, our next one would be um, Miriam. If you could lower your... Yes, thank you, Magda. I, I so much appreciate your, your knowledge and your wisdom. Uh, uh, as a building biologist, people who are now falling sick because of a new cell tower installation in their neighborhood, um, it is very important that they get the interior of their home assessed for sources and take any remediation that they can uh, because the combination of the indoor-outdoor exposures can spike a person's symptomology or just simply accumulate to a point where symptoms do start to show. So I think it's very important that people know that they can reduce their exposure by at least doing something about the inside of their homes. Thank you, I agree with you entirely and that's really good um, um, information to have. One of the things I would say is if you're living in a small community, uh, one of the things we found when we go into homes and, and you know, smaller communities, not places like Montreal or Toronto, um, we find that most of the radiation is coming from things within the home. And when you get rid of that, you can have virtually no radiation in some locations. So having your home measured, whether you do it yourself or hire a building biologist is extremely important. Okay, we're gonna go on to Carla Atoni. Could you unmute yourself? Carla? Yes. Hi, hi, I'm Magda, hi. Um, I'm uh, yeah, in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, thank you very much. And I've been, I admire all your work and I've been struggling for almost a year to get our private school year to go from wireless to wired. But my question, as I only have one question is, um, which uh, cell phone cover protection cover do you recommend for my husband always puts his cell phone obviously in his pocket well now that he's more aware but men don't have a choice they always put it in their pocket so we actually ordered one that came here from overseas and it actually doesn't really work oh because I've, I've got a, we've got an acoustic i've got an acoustic meter so we've measured it so which which site or website do you recommend or which make or brand do you recommend okay well i don't <laughs> I don't recommend a specific brand. I do know that there's material that's extremely effective at shielding. I would probably go to uh, one of those two websites I recommended um, and talk mm -hmm. to the people there. They're extremely knowledgeable and they'll tell you what, what really works and what doesn't. Chances are um, the more expensive ones are going to be better. They use silver fiber in some of the shielding. And so the more silver you have, the finer the mesh, the more uh, effective they are. So I would go to those two websites and ask them for their advice. And then you would just wrap it around the phone and into your pocket or something like that. Yeah, so you, you put it in, it has to, it, okay. If your cell phone is completely covered, it's yeah, not, then it's not gonna work. It's not going no. to work. So you have to have some opening, but what you wanna make sure is that if you've got it in your pocket, that the, the, um, the shielding is between your cell phone, you know, your shielding here and then your body. Okay, yeah, okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Okay, we have, um, Esteban Meyer, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi, how are you from South America? Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for- Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, just a little question. Uh, what about allergies? I have my kids and people around me that when they are working with the computer and the notebooks and with wireless, uh, they feel like uh, uh, there is a 
trigger of on allergies. What do you think? Well, there's evidence of that. Uh, Dr. Ola Johansson did work on this a long time ago where um, he found that people who were exposed to computer screens um, developed um, a rash on their skin um, and it was a histamine reaction. So this is quite well documented, uh, especially by him. There's also some evidence that um, it exacerbates things like asthma in people. Um, and so if you've got that happening, the best thing to do is try to minimize your exposure, find out what's causing it, um, and then try to minimize that. So that's not out of the question, what you've just asked. It, it fits with the literature. Okay, Thank Jeffrey? You. Jeffrey? Yeah, that, that's, that's probably, it's probably me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I live in a uh, multi multi unit uh, apartment. I'm in I'm in a uh, city like area Hoboken next to uh, Manhattan, and um, I noticed. Um, I wonder if there's an exponential uh, increase of of uh, exposure and therefore symptomology. I I have five floors beneath me. The, there's several smart meters in the cellar below. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, internet connectivity. There's this and people are working from home, et cetera. But that, it's, it seems to have been over the last uh, 15 years, I would say it's pro that's probably epidemiological. There, there's probably a, a, some kind of correspondence between how much, uh, how, how, how frequently we've gone wireless uh, through each floor and, and subsequently there's, there's 11 units here. So I've got, I'm wondering if that's, if that's cumulative and exponential in, and I'm on the top, very top floor, uh, uh, which houses a lot of the uh, the electrical, uh, you know, uh, air conditioning units, things like that, th things that have casings that are me metallic. And I'm in an old, I'm in a legacy apartment. I'm the last man standing here that that ha that that hasn't been converted to another form of, of of dwelling. So I have old pipes. And I'm wondering if, if this is, maybe this is a very obvious question to you, but I'm wondering if that's all uh, very, cum very cumulative, perhaps even um, uh, interconnected in terms of the effects that it's had on me, which is for 15 years, a lot of sleeplessness, uh, heart palpitations, uh, that, that kind of thing. I, I, I'm I've always been relatively sensitive to that. And oddly enough, I, uh, I like to do electronic art. So I'm, I'm opposite my uh, 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 fuse box in this room right now in the large computer that I, that I, that I do video work on. And my bed is adjacent uh, to that uh, about uh, 15 feet away. I don't know if that would have the effect, but I'm just thinking, is this some sort of a, a web of, of reactivity uh, between all these things? Could that be the case? Just well, the method. Yeah, you mentioned you're in Manhattan. Is that right? I, you're on mute. Well, if you did say you were in Manhattan, um, they've rolled out 5G in New York. Um, so they're having millimeter wave exposure. And I've been hearing from people that once 5G comes into a community, uh, a lot of people end up feeling unwell, um, much more than before that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're living in a multi-unit dwelling, um, the top floor is usually the worst place you could be uh, okay. because you're going to be exposed to radiation coming from the you know, rooftops and other buildings that have um, rooftop mounted uh, cell towers, for example. Um, you're going to be exposed to all the wireless technology within the building. Obviously, the people immediately beneath you are the ones that you need to be most concerned about. Um, there is material you can get to shield yourself uh, from uh, other places. You can uh, put film on windows. You, there's fabric you can put around your bed, which I would actually recommend in your case. Um, and you can get it from both of the websites I indicated earlier. Um, this is silver mesh that you put around. It's a canopy that you put around your bed and you cover yourself completely like a Faraday cage uh, under your bed as well. And that should allow you to sleep well. Uh, it would virtually eliminate, you know, 90% of your exposure. 
and uh, allow you to heal during the night too. So that would be one of the things I would recommend. Um, there's paint you can get put on your wall. So there's lots of ways, ways of shielding it. But the most important thing still is what you're generating in your own home. So make sure you don't have Wi-Fi, make sure you don't have cordless phone, and that will reduce your exposure quite substantially. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Cheryl, you, could I ask a question from the chat, please? Sure. Sure, go we ahead. Have, we have Leslie Weinstock asking, how many scientific studies are there that are peer reviewed and how many of those would be Supreme Court admissible? Well, I, I answered that question already and, and the answer is definitely hundreds, if not thousands. Okay, sorry, somehow I missed No problem. Cheryl Hamilton, could you unmute yourself and turn on your video if you like? Hi, Magda, thank you so much. It's an amazing presentation. I, I'm gonna put you on the spot, I'm afraid, because I'm wondering why there's such a taboo of the association of COVID with the wireless frequencies, especially those associated with the 5G frequencies. And I'd also like to know why you think the media has been so careful in not addressing any of this. Okay, sorry, could you, I don't understand your first question, why I'm taboo, I, what do you well, mean? Well, there was a study that came out of Spain that did so an, an association with increased COVID so-called infections right. with the communities that had the 5G. Why is there such a taboo with this association and no doctors or no, and no one is talking about it? Okay, um, that's an excellent question. And, um, I've actually done a little bit of digging, a little bit of research on COVID and 5G. And what I did is I looked at the US states that have 5G functioning and operating and those that don't. Um, and I did this with a colleague of mine. And what we found is that states that had uh, have 5G millimeter waves operating, the case rate and the death rate in those states is almost double the states that don't have 5G. And so if you, um, some people have made the claim that um, COVID is 5G radiation and it caused, you know, 5G caused COVID. And I think some of those claims are totally ridiculous and people don't want to be associated with anyone who's making a connection. However, the research is showing us there is an association. Whether that proves to be causal, we don't know. One of the things we do know about this radiation is it impairs your immune system. And so that would make people more susceptible. So we have some scientific evidence, but we don't know for certain. Um, but thank you for asking that question. Okay, um, next one is Bob Nadelberg. If you unmute yourself. Bob. Hello? No? Okay. Um, Ariana, uh, are you, if you unmute yourself? Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question and you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, what I was wondering is how much effect, like grounding sheets and these other devices, how much of an effect do they really have? Like, is it, is it, given the fact that if you have to undo plumbing and wiring and all of that, obviously that could be a big expense, you know, using these devices, like how much does it, how much does it actually make a difference versus going in and, you know, potentially tearing open the whole house? Okay, so you're asking how effective are grounding sheets? Well, grounding sheets, these devices to block the EMFs, like you mentioned, the, the fabric that can go around the bed, all of these different types of things. And I know that's a, it's a broad question, but just sort of in general, if somebody's weighing the pros and cons of buying, you know, grounding sheets and the shielding devices and all of that versus, you know, going in and doing a, a major renovation. Okay, well, uh, you don't need to do a major renovation. And um, there's a difference between grounding sheets and what I was referring to. I was referring to a canopy that you put around your bed. Um, a grounding sheet is something that um, some doctors are recommending and I'm not 
one who supports that concept. A grounding sheet is a sheet you put on your bed that has wires in the sheet and you connect it to the ground in your, in your um, bedroom. And some of those grounds are actually contaminated with ground current. Um, and so I don't recommend using grounding sheets. If you can ground yourself outside, um, that would be much more preferable. But actually being grounded by walking on the earth is one of the best ways that you can equilibrate yourself. So I'm not a fan of grounding sheets. Um, and you don't have to renovate your entire house. All you have to do is find out what in your house is wireless and then replace it with something that's wired. That's as simple as that. Um, a friend of mine says, all you have to do is, you know, unplug it and the radiation's gone. Okay, um, Tom, um, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the uh, explanation about the uh, confidence interval and the odds ratio on that particular type of study. There was a question asked in the in the post and about uh, different odds ratios and different confidence intervals, and I didn't get the takeaway. Does the confidence interval vary with the strength of the odds ratio? If the odds ratio is 1.5 versus 4.5, does the representation of a 95% confidence interval actually change? No. The two are totally unrelated. They're, they're two totally different uh, metrics. The odds ratio is giving you that, that value. Um, and the 95% confidence interval says, if we repeated this 100 times, it would fall within that value 95% of the time. So they're totally independent of each other. I understand like if we're looking at a bell curve, we're looking at mean and two standard deviations. But if we're looking at a table uh, on, that, on that question you asked on the post, yeah. You gave different examples of different odds ratios, the power of the odds ratios, and then different confidence intervals. So I didn't understand the discrimination of the answers there. Okay, as long as the odds ratio, if you've got a positive odds ratio of three, let's say, mm -hmm. if the confidence interval goes from um, one and higher, Yes. then that's statistically significant. If that confidence interval for an odds ratio of three drops below the one line, so let's say the confidence interval is 0.08 to three or four, um, that's not going to be statistically significant. So it's, it's almost irrelevant what the odds ratio is. Okay. I'm okay. still not understanding it, but I'll review it and, and uh, ask you again. You can contact me and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Okay. Okay, was that Tom Yamera? It wasn't, was it? Yep, it yes, was. Okay. Tom okay, sorry. Bob Nadelberg? Yes, uh, a question. And I, I don't mean this to be contentious, but I looked at the Marangel study and there was a retraction. And it looked to me as if that retraction was based on either technicalities from IRBs or perhaps politically motivated. But I'm just curious to know do you stand by? the findings of the study, regardless of its publication. Sorry, which one are you talking about? Could you just repeat the, that? The Marangel study, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, uh, cell phone study. Or, uh, you wireless. say Marangel? Marangel, yeah. OK, I, sorry, I didn't, hear, I didn't hear the first name, so I didn't know which study you were referring to. Uh, we, we did a study in Colorado that was published. We then repeated it in a number of other communities. Um, and I didn't go through ethical approval uh, before I did the study. I went through ethical approval after I did the study. Uh, right. They were all done. They were all done ethically, but my um, administrative paperwork was delayed. And so the journal asked us if we would retract it, which we did. Um, but we did it ethically. It was peer-reviewed, published. Um, uh, but because of the administrative problem, it had to be retracted. So I stand behind it. If yeah. anything shows exactly the same thing. Yeah, it and sounded like a technicality and I didn't know if, the, if, if that's all it was and it sounds like that is what the situation was. So right. the, the, the results of the study are, are still um, significant for what they showed in your opinion. They're still valid and the editors of the journal su suggested we submit it elsewhere which I haven't done yet. But okay. Can I ask one other question? Does a 5G uh, local cell tower emit only to the device that's receiving the signal? In other words, if, you're, if you have one outside your window um, and you aren't using 5G devices, is it going to be 
uh, impacting your cellular biology? You know, well, that's, that's a tricky question to answer because what they're saying is that the beam is going to be directed to the cell phone. Um, I don't totally understand how they can do that, uh, but that's what they're claiming. And I think, you know, there's so much misinformation about 5G. I don't want to guess at what the right answer might be. And I think what we just have to do is wait and see. Unfortunately, it's unlikely we're going to be able to stop 5G. And then once we're able to measure it, we can then answer some of the questions like the one you just asked. I simply don't know. Thank you. And Tom, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, Magda, I had a quick question, or actually a comment uh, regarding the woman who was concerned about um, cell phone radiation. And what I've discovered is that most people are walking around with their cell phones uh, with all three antennas turned on, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular data. And unless they're surfing the web or, yeah, basically, if they're not surfing the web, they don't need any of that stuff on, unless they're using a Bluetooth, which isn't recommended anyway. So if, right. they, want to, if they want to minimize their radiation, turn all those off. Excellent point. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't make it. Um, yes, you have multiple antennas on your cell phone and you don't need to have them on all the time. Um, I would actually recommend you keep your phone in airplane mode, turn Wi-Fi, you know, Bluetooth, all of that off, uh, cellular data off, and then just turn it on when you, when you need to check um, or when you need to make a call. And if you use it for things like photography, you don't have to use um, your cellular data. A lot of people were asking me, well, can I take a picture without having radiation? And the answer is definitely yes. Yeah, and most phones, most phones will be able to receive text messages with those things turned off. Uh, unless it's a, an iPhone with uh, their iPhone text thing. But um, most people, if they're using Android, if they just turn off all those three antennas, they can still receive text messages and send them and phone calls. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> okay. Igor, if you could unmute yourself, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mark, the first excellent lecture. I am building biologists from Slovenia, and I have been dealing with this problem for 10 years, uh, which are well known to me. I'm asking you if you know about the new insulin pump problems. My wife has uh, type one diabetes and she recently got a new insulin pump that has a wireless sensor to monitor her blood sh sugar. When I measured the sensor radiation, uh, I was horrified. At. What do you think about that this pump now giving to babies and young children with type one diabetes? Thank, thank you for that, Igor. I actually heard about these insulin pumps and I was horrified when I heard about yes. them. I've not measured one. If you could send me some of the readings you're getting, I would really appreciate that to see what it is. Um, and I think what we need to do is uh, educate the medical community that this might not be a, a smart idea, especially for younger people. I mean, I can see the value of it in that it keeps your insulin uh, steady during the day and that's very important. Um, but if it could be done wirelessly, that would be even better. And I don't know technically if they can do that. But thank I, you. I will, I will send you, no problem. I will send you by email the result of measurement. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any more questions? We've just reached about two o'clock. Um, would anyone like to share anything before we end today's session? Uh, this is Sandy Ross in California, and I did want to mention that we had success several years ago in uh, having people able to keep their uh, analog meters. They had to pay a fee for a couple of years, and I think that spread to some other states, and I would hope that uh, if people found out that they had a smart meter, which most of them do, that they would um, go ahead and try to demand that they not just get a wired smart meter, but that they go back to analog. Thank you for that. Actually in Fairfield, um, Iowa, 
um, there was a legal case about whether or not people could keep their analog meters. And I think the decision was that they could, but they would have to pay an extra, extra amount of money each month. Um, so, you know, this is something that is very much localized and you'd have to ask your local provider to see um, what, you, what your options are. Anyone else uh, would like to share some success stories with us? Magda, I, I uh, just wanted to make an, an announcement. This is Libby Kelly. Uh, there are so many questions in the chat box. I mean, it's amazing how many questions and, and many detailed answers are being given as well. But uh, clearly, uh, there's more questions you could possibly answer. I just wanted to remind everybody that we are going to be saving all of these questions from the chat. We're collecting all the questions and we will be getting back to people, not individually perhaps, but we will be uh, answering these questions and producing a document with the answers, not right away, but after the full conference. But that's our goal because these questions are very good and we wanna make sure that everybody gets the answers. And we'll be able to send them out to the people on this email list who are participating here? Yes, of course. Wonderful, thank you, Libby. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, what yeah. we'll do, we'll end. Sorry, was that someone? Uh, yes, please, uh, Dr. Habas, I have a question about wired cardiac testing equipment. There seems yeah. to be, at least in my area, a great difficulty obtaining this and getting the hospital systems to use it. Um, we have a psychology professor on board who's trying to work with the hospitals to promote this because there is some um, thought that this is all psychological. So we're trying to dispel that, which is a, a challenge. But um, even when we can find the equipment with the professionals that we have on board, it's really hard to get the physicians to order it. And I'm just wondering, do you have any good um, resources that we could tap into? And I'm sure other people have this problem. Actually, thank you for asking that. Um, if you go to the electrosensitive society uh, .com website, um, they are now beginning to um, enter hospitals and make them safe for people who are electrically hypersensitive. And we've had success at several hospitals now. The hospital staff are incredibly cooperative. Uh, we were really kind of surprised um, because we felt uh, we've had so much opposition when we tried to go into schools, for example. Um, and so if you go to the Electrosensitive Society website, the person who's the director of that is Sheena Symington, and she will provide you with information that we've used that allowed us to be successful uh, dealing with hospitals, particularly, um, and getting things as safe as possible. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And can I just say something else, Magda? Sheena, anybody who is suffering from electrohypersensitivity, if they need support in any way, or a family member, or any kind of accommodation in a workplace, please uh, contact us at the electrosensitivesociety.com. Thank you, Sheena. Okay, that will be the end of today's session. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to resume at the same time. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about dirty electricity, ground current pollution, and electrotherapy. And I look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you very much for participating and have a lovely day.